Yeah, you're good to start. Good to start? Yep. Okay. Cool. Exciting. Cool. All right. Hello. Um, thanks for sticking around. I'm Andrew, and I'm going to talk about the user experience of data merging, which is um, an interesting little it sounds very boring in some ways, uh, but it's actually a really interesting uh, subject that affects your users uh, a lot. And so I work at a company called Privy. Uh, I'm on Farcaster at Boot. Um, so cool. Um, disclaimer, if you came for answers, you might not get them. That's OK. Um, so a tale of two related challenges. We've got data quality, and we've got data sharing. Um, and these are not new challenges. There are great academic research papers in the 70s that talk about data quality and how to define quality and things like that. So it's not a new thing, but it, how we do it in the modern day and age is a little different. Um, hopefully, this is a, a wall of text. You don't have to read it all. But um, I used to work in personal finance. Um, and I think there are a lot of analogies. Uh, you work with a lot of data, mixing it in together. And I think we can learn a lot. So a lot of my examples are personal finance related. But you know, to, to kind of show some questions that you might ask when you're trying to uh, assess data quality, when you're trying to merge data quality, you, know, you might think of the precision of the data. So you can collect a salary range. I make 50 to 60K a year. Or a specific salary. I make 55K a year. And those might exist. So to, to draw the connection early, those could exist on the blockchain. Someone could report this information to one app. They might report a different piece of information to another app. I might trust the first app a lot more than I trust the second app, even though the first one is um, a little bit more generic. So you have a lot of these challenges. You have with data quality around uh, where what was the source, um, the age of the data. Um, my salary this year is different than from my salary three years ago. Or um, semantics. So uh, salary might mean something different in the US versus in the EU. Um, I picked two canonical examples here, credit score, which is uh, FICO is like the classic US uh, way to assess your credit score. It's used by a lot of uh, banks and businesses. But you have Vantage score, which is yet another option offered by a different credit bureau um, versus a bespoke credit score. Um, you have things where when it was sampled that are all challenges. And then income I kind of used before, but you have things like even as subtle as this was my salary before tax or after tax. Um, does it include equity or bonuses or things like that? And so I'm raising a lot of these questions because data quality existed in the, the world before, and it's gotten a lot harder in the world we live in um, with Web3 and how do you share data around. I think. I'll tie into some of the previous presenters around ceramic and disco and how they're surfacing information across the web. Um, we need to think about how we're consuming that. So the ta I said it was a tale of two related challenges. The second is data sharing. I'll give you a hint. It actually just pertains to data quality um, in a lot of ways. But it also is like, how do you overwrite data? Uh, is the data always available? When the data was collected, what consent was collected about that? Like, were they given consent to collect it? S which is hopefully yes. But also, did they specify how it should be used? Um, and then lastly, how do we avoid the ick factor? You've always, like, you know, you, you get that ad on Instagram that is a little too specific about something that you just talked about with your friends. That sometimes flirts the line with ick factor, but sometimes it's like, well, I got a really good bag recommendation, so, like, uh, do I care that much? Maybe not. Um, so there's complexities. So. When you think of storing data, I recognize that this is not a thing that everyone in this room might do. But you probably think of, OK, how do I data model? What are the privacy security pitfalls? What's the scalability? Is this going to be able to be available to all of my users at all times? It's generally, it's a back end problem. And no, it's not. I, <laughs> sorry, I, um, the reveal, this isn't true. And I think that the data composability of Web3 changes this a lot in a very interesting way where we didn't quite have it before. You have companies that collect the data and consume it themselves. And now we're collecting data and we're trying to share it around. This is the composability of the web, which I think is a really big promise and a really exciting promise. But we have to think about how we're consuming that now in a, in a way that we didn't before. Um, so let's play a game called Let's Collect an Ethereum Address. Um, 
I created a Google form because this is really easy and quick, um, you know, and I want to get my startup going. And so, you know, Ethereum address, please. Uh, I love Parks and Rec. So, um, and then it's got just two two questions: Ethereum address, Discord handle. I think in you know 2021, I probably filled this out 50 times. Um, everyone like wanted my address for a drop. They wanted to make sure I was in the community. Whatever you know, you can imagine this is a relatively common question to ask. Um, so it's going great. I got two responses. I got someone who gave me their raw address. Their uh, their Discord handle is cool zero 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 two. Um, and user two, which is like Boston is a decent city. Uh, which is a very questionable Ethereum name address, you know. But like, they, they chose it, uh, not me. Uh, and then Boston in twenty thirty, and so life got busy. I didn't ship my MVP, you know. Things slipped, and it's time to send out my invites. And kablam! Turns out cool zero 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 two fat fingered. They're cool zero zero three. Uh, they just forgot, and they like. You know, mess that up. And then this person, they were in Boston, they realized that it's actually cool. And so they bought Heck Yeah Boston and then let Boston is a decent city lapse because they didn't want to be associated with that. Someone else bought it up. They also, they, they were just, you know, earlier, later on the wave of realizing. And now you can see that data quality is really hard. And when we consume this data, uh, we need to be very thoughtful about how we're doing it. And this is a super explicit example. I'm collecting Ethereum addresses and discords for deciding you know, who gets to join my app first. Um, so uh, we've got timeliness in here, we've got inaccuracy, we've got uh, you know, name resolutions, all that. So luckily, crypto solves this. Um, we have uh, our first line, I decide to have users input their wallet and discord, and uh, feel free to shout out if you think that we've solved it so far. So this is our first attempt and now our second attempt. I realized that um, you know, I need to actually have users connect their wallet so that they don't mistype it, so that they, you know, maybe then I can get the actual address instead of just their ENS because their ENS is quick. And then I'm gonna have them input their Discord. Have we solved it? <laughs> I appreciate it. A lot of people shaking no, of course not. Uh, so I have them connect their wallet and we're gonna solve the Discord thing first. We're gonna link their Discord and we're gonna store their username and then we're off to the races, and we'll, we'll, we might have to do a little bit on the wallet later. Have we solved it yet? No. Thank you. Uh, no, we haven't, because guess what? People's discords can change. You can have like a, a custom, the, the 0002, if you decide to stop paying for, what is it, premium, uh, it disappears, so you actually had to store their discord SID, but nobody thinks to do that. Um, anyway, I'll give you a hint. We've now solved the discord thing. This is roughly, this is good enough. Um, but have we solved the wallet thing? I've alluded to. No. Okay, cool. So now I'm going to have them sign. So there's this weird uh, issue where you can actually forge when you connect a wallet. I could just create my own wallet that just says I have whatever address I want. It's a weird little thing, but it actually means that you have weird data quality issues that you could potentially sign someone up for something that they didn't want, or you could link data that you didn't intend. And so instead, I'm going to have them actually sign and prove that they have this address. Um, have I solved it? Are we good? Yeah. Almost, but not really. There's this weird extra attack where you can actually just find a signature from that public address and just replay it if it happens to be the same thing. So actually, you might have to put a little uniqueness in there. And now, we've solved it. Oops. We've solved it. Nailed it. Um, so. This is like a very long-winded way to talk about some of the data quality issues you have, and this is going to feed into data sharing. But I also want to call out, I miss our Google form. It was really easy, it was really simple. Most users aren't gonna mess it up. Like, can we just go back there? And like, the reality is developers that you might be consuming their data from, they care about simplicity, or maybe they're blissfully ignorant of some of those little subtleties that I think about because I do this for a living and like you know it's whatever but like most people don't really care or know that connecting a wallet doesn't actually mean you own the wallet like that's fine I don't think that they need to know and care that but it does mean that sometimes correctness is lost in there and so you know if we go back all of this is about us the the consuming company uh, and it's it's company oriented but the user really probably here maybe here 
would have been sufficient for the user. Like, this is a very quick onboarding. I hit the connect button, that submits my thing. I link my Discord button, you know, I'm off to the races. And I, I would hope that, you know, that's the, the end user experience that I get. Um, versus, you know, all of this, this is like three extra steps. Um, and so there's this weird, interesting trade-off where, you know, you, the data that, you, that is existing out there is questionably quality and we can't make value judgments on why it was collected the way it was. And yeah, so the drive to create value is, is real. Like people just need to get things done. The Google form is sufficient for me to start my startup. Um, I will say kind of caveat, you know, a uh, little self-promotion, Privy solves kind of bullet one. Adopt tools that do this data collection quickly and easily. We don't mess it up, uh, you know. But caveat, you know, let's say you didn't do that or whatever, or maybe you do that already. Um, I think the really interesting question is the, the data composability question. And so we have all of this information. Um, I put in two pieces of information in every single instance there. I put my Ethereum address and I put my Discord handle. I had to link both. Data composability winks at this future where maybe you just fill out one thing and you know I just have those two items that I wanted to collect, but you can imagine a world where it's a lot of other things. And so Web2 strives to do this too. This is not a new concept. Sign in with Google, you can get a whole bunch of information, you can request it. Sign in with Apple, has some fun customization. Shopify, it's not quite the same, but hey, every time I go to like a vendor and try to buy something online, it's almost always Shopify, and they almost always have my address and payment info, and there's something amazing about that. And so there are existing patterns of composability, but I think we get to start doing much more interesting things now. Um, and so now I open a question of what kind of data can we pull from? So we have the Googles of, the, of, of yesteryear. I'll make an analogy to Gravatar. Was anyone working on the Gravatar project? Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so unfortunately, I'm going to make fun of it slightly. It's gone. No, most people don't know what Gravatar is or haven't had a Gravatar. Um, singular identity is really hard. Um, it was a good product for while it was existing, but basically you could put in your email and you would get like the, the picture of the user, but the user had to do this themselves. They had to upload their Gravatar. Um, it doesn't exist anymore because like other companies and things took over and the reality is, you know, there wasn't the right incentive structure. Is Web3 different? We have ENS, uh, I use Tezos a lot, TZ Profiles, SNS, Solana Name Service. These are all new systems that squint, you look and you're like, that's a little similar to Gravatar, but is it the same? I, on the far right here, for example, uh, instead of just like a picture, we have attestations. So if you've been paying along, paying attention, um, uh, Evan gave a talk on verifiable credentials. These are verifiable credentials. Uh, you link a Discord and then it seals that, yes, uh, I have this Discord account and I can attest that I own it. Um, so you can do some kind of interesting stuff now. So is it different? Um, this, sorry, well, is Web3 different? I already double clicked on TZ profiles. Um, something that's interesting is the only reason one might be incentivized to do that is, for example, there's a site called FXHash. I really enjoy it. It uses uh, this public profile to verify information. So to actually go in and sign that Discord thing and the Twitter attestation, um, you do that because you want recognition within this app. But the interesting question is, the Gravatar had that same thing. They had companies that they paired with that, you know, fill out your Gravatar, you'll get your picture, et cetera. Is Web3 different? There's an ethos change, which I like. There's a push for federation and decentralization, um, which is very nice. Uh, I think there are tools that are better now. You have basic building blocks, ceramic, disco, the blockchains themselves. Um, and then you have this problem where you have ENS whose who surfaces, I'm, it's not a problem, it's actually a really good thing, uh, decentralized identity kind of um, from something like ENS, but it's not maybe actually the fix all. Um, and so author deciding on authoritative global identity is hard. ENS is probably the global authority on what your you know, digital name is on the internet right now, but um, you, know, you can put kind of whatever you want in there. Um, uh, again, calling back to Evan's presentation, 
she talked about how she has uh, Paris Hilton's Twitter account as her metadata, and it's not verified, but you know, if you wrote your app and consumed it, you would be like, ah, she's Paris Hilton. Um, <laughs> so you know, deciding on this authoritative global identity is hard. You're probably, well, I, I won't, I, I'll bury the lead. So I'll finish with one final example, um, which is we're gonna build this thing called Garden XYZ. Don't go there, I don't own it. Somebody's name squatting, it's the worst. Um, I really want to own Garden at XYZ. Um, but uh, in this hypothetical world, um, I'll use this to kind of close out the this, this summary of everything we've talked about. So in this, in this app, I want to plan and manage my garden on the web. Um, I'll use ENS, I'll grab the user's name and personalize and show that part. And then I have this other service, plants.xyz, which I also don't own, um, that's going to help get my users started. So, Tying back to the data composability question, the bootstrapping problem, plants.xyz is a web app that lets me store my favorite plant varieties. And using this is gonna be great. There's a lot of plants in the world and having them input it every time is not great. Um, and so, the challenge is that usage and consent are at the core of how you, as, uh, you assemble identity. So ENS, easy, the user puts this up there knowingly, maybe there's some data quality issues, but this is my global profile. But let's say plants.xyz, they decided they were gonna store this on chain. First off, don't store user data on chain uh, in raw form, it's like questionable, unless they're really consenting for it. Maybe the, the onboarding experience wasn't super clear. When they said build your plant profile, they didn't mean literally build it on the blockchain, that doesn't make sense. Um, and so we at Garden might not know this, we're not in connections. So step one, you know, interact with the people that you're consuming data from, but you might not know it, you see it as a public API and public benefit, and so you consume it. So how do I use this? I onboard the user, I fetch their ENS when I get their uh, address, I query the chain for plants.xyz data, and I see that they like orchids, and I just fill the screen with orchids. I'm like, heck yeah, welcome orchid lover. And they're gonna be like, what? I never, what? How do you know this? Um, and so uh, this, it was missing a grand reveal. Pretend you don't see this part. This doesn't exist. Um, and so you don't want to do things like that with this data. I think in a lot of situations, you actually want to do something more like offer a modal, where you can declare your intention. Here's what I'm importing. Here's why I'm importing it. And even though we can already see the data, you should not assume that the user meant for you to see and use that data. Seeing is a little different than using. I, there's, there's like some subtleties there, but like just because I can read doesn't mean that I should show like orchid information in every context that I possibly can. Um, this has been a fun little experiment. I'm gonna close off with some rules to live by. Um, thank you for playing along, but generally speaking, be a good citizen. If you're throwing data on chain, and this can be things like verify, verifiable credentials and other things like that, you need to document the context in which it was captured. You need to document the permissions that are intended around that. Should people read it? What context should they be able to read it? Um, second is trust but verify. This is a little bit back to the earlier part. We can't pretend that every data source is useless. This is not how you make apps. This is not how you benefit from composability. I think that in the Web2 world, you could treat it a lot more adversarially, but I think the Web3 world kind of pushes for data is a little bit more collaborative. And so I think that it's important that we see it as valuable, but we cannot pretend that it is infallible and it is gold. Um, when in doubt, prompt the user. The user is the authoritative assembler of their data, mostly. There are certain caveats like they, you know, they can't just forge their passport um, and things like that. But the data that they want to assemble, the links that they would like to make, for the most part, they should be in control. Um, and so things like asking active consent are really important. And then lastly, provide recourse to correct information. If I surface plants.xyz data and it's not theirs, some reason like plants.xyz did something wrong, um, I think it's really important to surface that a way for them to opt out or for them to unlink and then it's on you to report that backwards. So it's me at garden.xyz need to go and have a talk with plants.xyz when the user reports how the hell do you have this information. Um, 
Thank you so much. As I said, I work at a company called Privy that handles a lot of this stuff. Where there was a very cool visual, but um, it's not on here for some reason. It's the easiest way to onboard all your users to Web3. Um, feel free to reach out and chat with me or these two fine folks in the front uh, if you would like to learn more. Um, our goal is to solve some of this for you, but also um, work with you to figure out what your problems, etc., cetera, are. Um, have a good one. Thank you. I don't know how we're doing. Five minutes. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, any questions? Thank you for your time. Yes. How do the, 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 the web two actors at doing the sort of backend reporting? If, if, if there's a, I, I guess, what are the best class practices for uh, user recourse to that data in the internet today? Um. I don't know about like, so, so for example, Facebook has a really good clawback um, policy. I, they were kind of forced to do it by law, so I don't want to give them too much credit, but if someone asks for their data to be unlinked, uh, to be removed, uh, you have to blow away pretty much everything relating to Facebook data from your system. Uh, I think that's like kind of an interesting example. Again, they were forced to do this by law. Um, you know, Cambridge Analytica and all. Uh, so I you know, don't want to give them too much credit, but I think it is an ex a good example. Yeah. Um, I thought your, your suggestion about like, if, even if you can already read this data, yeah. still ask for consent to use it, yeah. it's interesting. And I guess I wonder, is that giving users a sort of false sense of security yeah. by like kind of playing dumb that you can't actually see this data that you really can? Like, if yeah. that data is public, shouldn't the users like no. shown that that's like, hey, just you know, like I was wondering if a better solution might be use the data yeah. and then have a footnote at the bottom, like wondering where we found this data. Yeah. It was there on chain. I yes. Yeah. I think it's some blend in there because I will call out something that you're doing is likely remixing that data. And so, you know, you have, you know, plant data and then you're going to continue to store it and change it and alter it. And so um, as far as like data control matters, uh, you might take the string ORCID, inject it into some other piece of your database. And so for them to understand that you're bringing that data in and using it in some way, um, I think is something worthwhile. But I agree, like needlessly surfacing uh, consent or um, kind of the, yeah, like the, the more optional opt out approach that doesn't feel too dark patterny is is a really good balance. So thank you. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> or is that gonna be yeah, show up in other places. Yeah. yeah. I mean that one's but still like <laughs> another interesting that, that is out like Yeah. I agree, but also like if the data is public, people are reading it and pretending that it's not. Oh yeah. I don't know, I, like, I, I, I like the yeah. ideal solution would be that the data is encrypted and access controlled, and you have to get user consent to access it. Yeah. But don't do the once it's out there, pretending like playing dumb that you can't read it when you really can. Because that I don't know about the telex users. Not necessarily playing dumb, but another example is like if, you use, if there's open source code on GitHub with a non-commercial license, mm -hmm. you can still see it. Um, and yeah, the burden is on maybe you're suing them if someone. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting challenge of a like an ethically neutral versus an ethically good approach, um, which is you know we're, we we can't get too far into ethics, but one part really is informative to the user and helps them evolve their thinking of their data, and the other part is technically legal. Uh, so you know, like, <laughs> um, which is you know I. I there will be plenty of situations where I do that, and I like to think that I try to be good to, you know, our users and things like that. But it's you know, everyone finds their little part to, to push the world forward. So, anything else? I think we're also at time, so I want to let the next speaker. Sit. Thank you so much.